This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. We are in the life of Moses, and Exodus chapter 3 is our next chapter. We won't get all the way through the chapter. Uh, we're going to cover this morning Moses' encounter with God, and then next week we'll cover the content of, of what uh, the conversation w between Moses and God were. Uh, so we'll kind of hold that for next week. But here we have Moses at the burning bush. There we go. Moses, or Moses chapter 3. Wow, no, it's Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we'll start reading in verse 1 here. Uh, you'll notice what we covered in the previous weeks is really the connection point between Moses leaving Egypt and this chapter here. This is kind of the high point um, of, of the... It's a high point in the story is probably a good way to put it. And so all this about Moses and Midian is really kind of prepping us for what's happening in, in this encounter in chapter 3. Chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Uh, we'll pick up there next week. But uh, again, to bring kind of in perspective, Moses' life can be easily divided into three chunks. His first 40 years from birth and education to Egypt, in Egypt, excuse me. We are at the end here of this next 40 years. So he is now how old? Approximately here. He's about 80 years old, or, or right around maybe 79, 80. It's that, it's that latter um, Set part of this year's because this call will lead him into his next 40 years where he returns to Egypt and then leads the children of Israel out. So uh, he's not a young spry chicken at this point, um, but he's taking care of sheep. Uh, he's there. Uh, the location, he's there at Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is the same name as what other mountain? Sinai. Very good. Yep. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same place. Um, and if I was going to put a nice, neat map on your handout, and then I found out how confusing and convoluted this is, and nobody has a map of all the major suggestions of where Mount Sinai is or Mount Horeb. Nobody really has a good one that can put, and I didn't put one together myself. Uh, but anyway, with Mount Sinai and Horeb being the same, um, we know it's at least... Uh, it was like a week journey out of Egypt or so many days. So it's, it's a long ways to travel, at least from Egypt. And so there's people who put it, uh, if you're familiar with the Sinai Peninsula, where you have Egypt and the Red Sea, um, some people put it way over by Egypt on this side, and some people put it way over by Midian. Some put it up on the other side. I'm not sure where it is. 
I don't think it's the key point of the passage. Um, but there's things going on in this story. The way Moses is writing it, he's writing it and he's telegraphing things to the reader. And when I say telegraph, what do I mean by that? That's a word. We, it's a word that we don't use all the time, so that's why I'm going to find it. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's okay. It's it's like hinting, hinting at things. Okay, so have you ever um, read like a fictional book or a novel, and they're hinting at things? They they write things in a certain way that you're like, hmm, I wonder if they're coming back to this. Okay, Moses is writing this in such a way. Um, <clears throat> he's hinting at some things, and I want to pick up on some of that. Was this the first mountain where God met with his people? Okay. Was there ever any other mountains where God met with people? Before this. Or, or anywhere in scripture? Okay. Okay, Mount Moriah with Abraham, right? Okay, good. That was on a mountain. Anywhere else? Okay, uh, Mount Carmel, and that's going to come later with, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. What's that? Okay, yes, Mount of Olives, New Testament. Um, that kind of, Mount of Olives is, is going to be very connected with Mount Zion, because it's in the same region, and Mount Zion gets spoken of as the mountain of God, so um, anyway, any Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and there's some speculation that the Mount of Transfiguration was the same as uh, Mount Moriah. I think I can't remember. I don't quote me on any of that. <laughs> okay. There's another mountain we don't generally think of. And it's not, it's like, at first you're going to be like, what? But Eden, the Garden of Eden was situated on a mountain. And you say, what, Pastor, where are you getting that? Well, let's look at Genesis 2. Okay, uh, it's right there in the handout below the question here. It says, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. There is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Belium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is uh, Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittichel, that which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, rivers flow what direction? Downhill. Okay, well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a mountain, does it? I mean, it's just, it could be a gradual slope. This is where Ezekiel kicks in. In Ezekiel 28, here we have, uh, I should probably preface this, this is a very, uh, yeah, I'm going to preface this. This is a lament and a oracle against the king of Tyre. So it's, it's he's a king who's, who's doing evil, it's against a real person, all right? But here's where the commentary split on this, is this, this passage gets into uh, um, a divine rebellion in the past, like with Lucifer and stuff like that. So people are like, well, is it really talking about the king of Tyre or is it talking about the past? And the answer is yes, it's talking about both. Um, Ezekiel's writing, he's, he's writing about the king of Tyre, but he's digging up a, a story of the past of this rebellion uh, in heaven. And he's, he's likening that to the king of Tyre. So yes, he's, he's hitting both at the same time here. Um, I'm going to give you some context here. But in this passage, it says, uh, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, he's talking about the garden of Eden. Okay, we've got that clear connection. 
Every precious stone was thy covering. Um, there, it, go, it lists a few stones there in that ellipsis. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Where was he talking about? He was talking about the Garden of Eden. So, why, why does it matter? What is this a point? Well, mountains were a point in the ancient world's thinking. These are the places where you met with God. This is where even the false gods dwelt. The people of Israel, um, during the time of the kings, if they were going to offer and worship false gods, where did they go? Yeah, and, and we use a different phrase there. High places. Okay, and we see in First Kings. I mean, it, it's peppered all through Scripture. I just put two different examples here for you, but um, in First Kings three two, uh, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord in those days. In Second Chronicles thirty three, nevertheless the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. So there is in the Old Testament. The, the aspect of high places, these are places you might go to meet with your God. Um, and I say it that way because the same was true with like Baal and Ashtaroth. They went to these high places to perform these ceremonies to worship these different deities or gods that they believed. So when someone's on a mountain or in a mountain, Moses is, is hinting to us, hey, this is, this is the turf of God. Now, moving that to a modern context, if you go up a mountain, are you closer to God? Okay. No, it's not. The whole earth is God's. Uh, God is everywhere. Why do you think it was that people thought of mountains as, as places where God's dwelt? Okay, well, there's that. You know, they, they would observe more. That's true. Secluded from who or what? They're secluded from people. <laughs> Thus, bring back the Garden of Image Im imagery of, of lush and, and, and wonderful. Go ahead. I would say that probably it extends even further back to the Tower of Babel, where mm -hmm. trying to say that they're higher and closer to God. Okay, so now, oh, y yes. <laughs> you're, you're tying into something because there's the actual mountain element of getting closer to God, but then there's the, the ziggurat or the man where they're also trying to do that. And, and think of it this way, too. If you were going to try to build a building incredibly tall, and you're trying to actually reach up into heaven, would you start on a plane? No, you'd start on top of it. So, but they built the Tower of Babel where? On the plane of Shinar. So height is not... What's that? Yeah, they don't, you know, but they could have moved or whatever. But mountains in the ancient world were remote. They were formidable. Um, there was, you know, obviously you get up past a certain elevation. There's no vegetation because of the, what do they call that line? Timberline. Timberline, okay. But to the ancient Near Eastern person, nobody lives up on the top of a mountain. They're, they're too remote. They're too difficult. This is the place of the God. Now, Moses is not meeting with the gods. He's not meeting with Baal and Asherah. He's meeting who? The God of Israel, the angel of the Lord. Comments or questions here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those who live up on like Laramie Peak, it takes a special, special type of person to stay up there. Mm -hmm. Right. The reality is, over in Israel, most of these mountains are much smaller. Well, they built their cities on the sides of the mountain. And so it was just the prominent point of town. Yeah. Just below the surface or the top of the mountain. Yeah. So, 
Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. They, they will look as big as Laramie Peak if you're down at the bottom of the Jordan River Valley. Oh, okay. But it's a long ways. Because you're uh, not at 2,500 feet up to the level of um, Jerusalem. Oh, wow. And so you're talking, the, the rise in Jet is probably 3,500 to 4,000 feet. Right, so. so like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> It looks, yeah. So this concept of mountains, um, the new uh, dictionary of biblical theology puts it this way. While the concept of a cosmic mountain is somewhat fluid, okay, this idea kind of, it wasn't fixed like a one size fits all. It denotes a place where the gods are to be encountered in a special way. And here Moses is meeting God on a mountain. Abraham had met God on a mountain. The Garden of Eden is where Adam and Eve communed with God on a mountain. So there's this, this imagery going back and going forward. Um, in the Psalms, Mount Zion is pitted against Mount Bashan. Okay, so there's kind of a, a turf war, you might say, between the God of Israel and Mount Bashan or the God Baal. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Uh, the reality is, if the passage uh, is talking about the Garden of Eden, and obviously rivers do flow downhill, right? The oceans were like they are today. The mountains are like no. The flood would have changed all that. So right. that's. So it might have been the highest point, but that would be. I find it. I find it fascinating when people are like, oh, we found the original Garden of Eden. I'm like, oh, did you really? I mean, the world being changed by a flood, how would you know? I, I, I've i looked at some science stuff, and, and when the flood happened, it's highly likely tectonic plates were moving on the earth ma massively, and things were happening. So I don't think anybody's really found the Garden of Eden. And anytime they say they do, it, it's like, if you watch a doc, I've seen a few documentaries and it's like, they're only presenting one side. You, you know, they're like not really telling you the information that doesn't fit well with their theory. They're only framing it a certain way. So, yes. Um, and, and the Garden of Eden, it doesn't really matter where it was. It, it's just the fact that Ezekiel refers to it as a mountain. And yes, we have the rivers there pulling from it. So, um, that's another thing about mountains, though. They're seen as a source um Water and springs often flow down from different mountains, so they became, you know, there's a source of life coming from them. Uh, I mean, this is just how ancient people viewed and think, thought about things. Another interesting thing here with this encounter, um, any other questions on mountains before we move on? Okay, this is Mount Horeb. We don't know where it is, but it's a mountain, and I've brought in some of the ancient Near Eastern connections here. Um, who is this angel? In verse... Two, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame. Uh, all right, so is this an angel sent from God, or is it God himself? Um, well, it's probably God himself, and here's why. Verse 4 says that when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the midst of the bush. Now look back at verse, verse 2. Who does verse 2 say is in the midst, midst of the bush? The angel. But it jumps from the angel to verse 4 being the Lord. So who's in? Who's really in the bush? <laughs> Both. Uh-huh. I want to tie something to that thought. So that's why I wonder if maybe it was the angel first to draw Moses to the bush. Is Jesus God? I mean, I mean, did did people see Jesus and not die? Okay, and and, and true. It, 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, I get it. But there's a similarity here. But, but, um, has this angel been around or been seen before? Okay, so, so there's... Well, I think we do know, but you have to tie several texts together, and that's what we're going to do here. Um, the, this passage is one of those passages, and, and the reason I highlight this is the Jews have seen this passage, and the rabbis have looked at this this type of thing before, and they recognize something's going on because there's two there's there's the Lord and there's the angel, but yet they're kind of conflated as one. D does that make sense? Now um, they kind of get blurred. The distinctions are blurred. So um, Genesis forty eight. This is the end, or what Jacob thought was the end of his life, because um, he lived for a little while. Longer. But anyway, he's he's blessing his children, and and Jacob does a similar thing. He says um, in verse fifteen of Genesis forty eight, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the, and it doesn't say God, what does it say? The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Okay, now he goes on there with the blessing, but the word bless is singular. He doesn't say, God did this, God did this, the angel did that. They bless the lads. He says, God did this, God did that, and he blessed the lads. So there's kind of a, a conflation here. There's a merging of this angel figure and God. Now, does that mean every angel of the Lord is God? No, it doesn't. And we'll kind of get into that. Um, there's another thing that sets this angel apart. Now, this is going to come later in Exodus. But this angel has the power to judge. Um, in Exodus 23, about the middle of page 4 here, it says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So there's two things that sets this angel apart. The angel that brings them along the way, he, he has the power to forgive sins or to withhold that forgiveness, but he also has the very name or presence of God in him. Is that true of just every angel that God has made? No. So there's a, there's a uniqueness here with this angel of the Lord. Beginning of Judges. Um, this angel is referred to again. It says, And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal uh, to Bachim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt. Well, who's the angel in the bush and who's the angel involved with bringing him out so far? It's this angel of the Lord, right? I made you go up out of Egypt. I brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So this is the angel of the Lord that starts off here meeting Moses in the bush. He is the angel of the Lord that delivers them out of Egypt. He gives them victory in the promised land. Uh, I didn't, oh, I did include it here. Um, just before they go into the, oh no, I didn't, sorry. I saw the word Jude and I thought it was Joshua. Um, I'm really getting off my rocker. Just before Joshua conquered Jericho, he met someone else. It didn't go by the name angel of the Lord. It went by commander of the Lord's host. But do you remember that encounter where Joshua says, whose side are you on? And the angel or the, the captain of the Lord's host said that he's on the side of the Lord. He's not really on either side. And Joshua's response was what? He fell down. He worshipped him. He also took off his shoes there. Okay, Taking off his shoes. Where did... Oh, Moses took off his shoes here at the burning bush too. So this angel of the Lord gets connected in several ways. In the New Testament, Jesus gets connected to this. In Jude 5, and there's a little bit of a, a textual thing here, but five, Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you knew this once, how that the Lord, 
and some manuscripts there read Jesus instead of the Lord, um, how that the Lord, having saved his people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Now, whether it's the Lord or Jesus is not the big point. Who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? God did. But you can also say the angel did. So the same way we talk about God and Jesus, or God the Father and Jesus, there's a lot of similarities with how we talk about this angel, the Lord, and God. For instance, um, this angel is God, but he isn't God. Jesus is God, he isn't the Father of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this angel had the power to forgive sins. Wasn't that one of the issues in Jesus' ministry? We don't mind that you heal people, just don't claim to be God and don't forgive people's sins. That's something only God can do. But he forgave sins. Uh, there's an association with the name or the presence of the Lord. We read that in Exodus 23. But in John 17, there's a lot of association between Christ and the name or the presence of God. So, I think, and I'm not going to be rock hard, on, I think this angel of the Lord is actually Christ involved in the Old Testament before we know him by the name Christ. I think it's God the Father and Christ here both working in tandem, working together. They are three, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're three, but they're one, right? Which is why you get that funny language like with Jacob of the God who did this, the God who did that, the angel that did this, but he, the singular, he blessed the lads, okay? So um, there's, a, there's a connection here to Jesus. Um, the other thing that's I want to make sure I mention clearly, not every time we see an angel in the Old Testament, that doesn't mean every time it's an angel, it's Jesus. It could be the angel of the Lord could mean an angel that the Lord has sent, Okay, so there's a couple things to maybe look for as you're reading to figure out the difference. Uh, the angel of the Lord here, his actions are particular to de deity. Only God can forgive sins. And in uh, Exodus 23, that was one of the things this angel could do, was forgive sins. Um, there's a blurring of the pronouns between the angel of the Lord and God himself. There's something there going on. And, and ancient rabbis picked up on this. They, they recognized this. They're like, this is weird. This is odd. This isn't what we would expect. There's kind of an enigma that surrounds the name. Uh, there's at points, they say, don't ask for my name. Uh, so that happens where there's some unique things there. And often this angel will speak on his own authority. Whereas when other angels show up, they're letting you know, uh, this is a message from God. Okay, they're not speaking on their own authority. Now, the authority thing, did Jesus, what, what was it about him and how he spoke? What did the people around him say? He speaks, yeah, with authority, with his own authority. So there is a, there's a lot of connection and a lot of linkage between this angel of the Lord and Jesus. Um, so much so, I, I am convinced Angel of the Lord, when he shows up in the Old Testament, I think it's Christ before he was incarnated. Yeah. Right. Right. So he obviously was not seeing God the Father. Right. And you know, in theology, there are two terms of theophany right. and a Christophany. Right. And there is a very big blur between the two. Yes. And, which would appear as an angel or as a person that right. shouldn't be there. Can we think of a time when God appeared in such a way that people didn't even think he was an angel? Well, Abraham. Okay, Abraham. Genesis 18. Three men show up, two of which 
are angels, and one of which is God. And now, which member of the Trinity? I I don't know. <laughs> it might be God the Father. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you're right. There's a, that blurring there, but there's a cloaking that takes place. Right. You know, God can't reveal himself in his full glory because if he does, we die. Okay? But God is not limited in that he can't veil himself in humanity or in an angelic form that, okay... I can see you, I can converse with you, and I'm not dead, okay? Do you remember, it's, it's a funny story, really, when the angel of the Lord comes to um, Samson's parents, and the husband, he's like, oh no, we're going to die now, because we saw God, and his wife, I, I, for, I'm sorry, forgive the comic slapstick view of this, but his wife is like, come on, come on honey, I mean, if he gives us a message of what we're going to do and what's going to happen, do you think he's going to kill us? I mean, really, here, if God comes and gives us a message, we're not going to die, all right? He's, he's got a purpose and a plan. Um, that story cracks me up. Uh, but yeah, God comes in a, and theophany is, is the term of, of an appearance of God, um, where Christophany is, okay, this is the appearance of God, but it's Christ in the Old Testament before the incarnation. Um, I myself lean to that, although I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know if I can put that on like the Abraham passage. I, I don't know for sure if that's Christ, but Christ said before Abraham was, I am. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. So there's some language there that, well, maybe Christ interacted with Abraham in such a way that, you know, I, I, it's, there's a lot going on here, and some of it's quite frankly beyond me. I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. Okay, another one here. Any other comments or questions on this angel of the Lord? Yes, dear? Oh, James has a question. Oh. Right. That was God's covenant. So, so that kind of is tipping us off. This isn't just an angel as a messenger. Cause, yeah. cause the root of what an angel is, is they're messengers. That's why the same word, the Hebrew word malak can also be used of people. I mean, it sounds weird, but angels, the word malak gets used of priests and of other people because they're, they're surveying the capacity of a messenger in the Old Testament. Now, that doesn't mean every messenger is an angel, and it doesn't mean every angel is always serving in that capacity, but there's a lot going on here. We'll just move. <laughs> All right. See here, the paradox. The fire does not consume. Okay, fire in the Old Testament uh, and throughout Scripture is frequently associated with the divine presence in divine encounters in the Old Testament and in other Near Eastern religions. Can you think of any other instances where fire happens and it's clear that God's involved? Okay, Mount, Mount Farm, Carmel, fire falls from heaven. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, the plagues that are about to happen on Egypt. I think New Testament. Ascending an axe with cloven tongues of fire. Um, interesting thought. If you had fire on your head, would your hair burn? But we have no indication these guys' hairs were burning. All right. So this is the same type of thing where um, there's a fiery presence around the Lord. Uh, in the prophets, when they see the Lord, there's often fiery language around the throne of the Lord. Um, Isaiah, when he's in the throne room and... and and in Ezekiel, uh, there's fires associated with uh, the divine presence, with the presence of the Lord. Um, just by way of application here, God was getting Moses' attention. What lengths does God have to go to get our attention? Now, you or I, would, if we saw a bush on fire that was burning, and it wasn't burning up, 
we would probably go see it too. But how much or what does God have to do to get our attention? How, how sensitive are we to him? I think, uh, for sake of time, I'm going to close out there. Do we have any comments or questions? I'll pick it up and, and maybe continue another lesson next week. Yeah. I think we think we would immediately respond to the act. Uh, <coughs> we might not recognize trying to get our, for instance, sin. Yeah. Well, and they, even Moses, he had to look at the bush long enough to realize it wasn't burning up. You know, and, and, I, and that's, but like, like you brought up Samuel. The Lord is speaking to Samuel. Um, it, it starts that section with the word of the Lord was rare in those days. He wasn't very common. Um, people didn't, they weren't having visions. They weren't, ha and so God is speaking to Samuel in such an audible way that Samuel's confused. He thinks it's Levi. What's that? Yeah, that's what. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> um, he thinks it's Levi. Uh, Levi, Eli. Now you have me mixed up. He thinks it's Eli. But what was the position of Samuel's heart? It was receptive, and so he responded to what he thought was correct. He went to Eli twice, and Eli finally gets the clue and goes, "Okay, this time, just say the Lord." You know, speak, Lord, thy servant listens. And so he wasn't accustomed to this. But then he gets a message of God that is rough. Here's a little boy getting a message of God that, you know, the guy you're working under, yeah, I'm going to kill off his kids, and he's going to die too, and I'm going to make you the next judge or, or, or priest. or You know, it would be kind of a rough message for a, what was he, 8 or 12, something like that. Uh, kind of a rough thing for a boy to take. So, anyway, yes, uh, we should be receptive to the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the, the story and life of Moses. I ask that you um, would help us to be sensitive to your word and to what you're doing. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.